Um, I'm just going to talk quickly about um, the immunological review we wrote this year, which was published. And um, after Trump's dec decision yesterday to withdraw from the Paris uh, <laughs> Climate Pact, I'm going to do my presentation completely in French. So I'm starting. <laughs> There we go. Any more give us them now. <laughs> there we go. Le syndrome de fatigue chronique et le système immunitaire ou un somnu maintenant. There it goes. Well, the reason it's in French is because um, we've been asked by uh, the NCCN, which is the official journal for the French uh, Society for Neurophysiology, to write a review on immunology and chronic fatigue syndrome on the uh, feature on uh, fatigue, which we did. And um, interesting. It turned out quite well. A um, couple of weeks after we published, I received a, an, uh, a text from a colleague of mine who works in Kensington Institute saying, I think you need to check PubMed because I think your article is trending topic, which it was on uh, PubMed for a couple of weeks, which is really interesting, which shows there was definitely interest in uh, what we do, not only by the patients, but also by the scientists in the field. So uh, what we wanted to do in, the, in, the, in this, uh, what we wanted to do in this review is to summarize the, pre the present state of knowledge related to uh, immunological findings in patients with ME/CFS, and um, I just wanted to point this out as well because it's really important. And uh, yesterday also, uh, a pediatrician from Norway indicated how important it is that we basically focus on the two different groups of the children between 10 and 19, and also the elderly from 30 to 39, which is really important for our research. What we're doing. Um, Sorry? Excuse me. <laughs> so before we start, so where are we going? Um, at, at least I got your attention. <laughs> so the, right, the wide range of symptoms described in ME-CFS um, have seriously hampered attempts to perform um, biomedical research. And uh, we've gone from looking at biomarkers now to really detailed studies uh, described by different groups throughout the last two days in a number of areas now, and they're being carried out really good, which is really promising. And also the increased expertise in MECFS researchers, allowing improvements in interpretation of the data, the methodology, we've heard about it, and case or story, and the high quality citations as well. Um, a, bit, a little bit of the cellular cytotoxicity, cytotoxicity in MECFS. Um, the firewall infections we all know about, and the features with NK cells, uh, reduction of numbers and function uh, could be a signature of MECF, but it's really important that we know that the viral infection, which is really important, which will affect NK cells. Also, really nice to see the recent work which focused on the molecular basis of NK cells. Um, Nancy Climas' group looked at the DPP4, CD26, which is an activation, um, also of killing, the, the genomic polymorphisms we heard already um, on our K cell receptors. Uh, reduce NK cell cytotoxicity related to SNPs and genotypes. These are really vitally important studies looking at NK cells to really understand what's going. And um, as Jacob already said, the publication of negative results is really important, which basically reveals also the methodolo methodology which we can discuss with all the scientists around here. Look, also looking at cytokines, which are really important proteins uh, which communicate between uh, immune cells, but also cells in the nervous system, which is really important. And um, cytokine profiles can indicate the source of cytokine production. So it will tell us something about cells involved, not only in the immune system, but also in the nerve system. And um, which is also shown that inconsistency in studies, again, methodology, sampling, and controls. But the nice thing about it is that now we see robust data and big cohorts uh, using of control groups. Um, for example, proven EBV infection versus proven EBV infection, which developed MECFS. Um, published by Hickey et al., um, looking also at adolescents developing MECFS from infectious mononucleosis compared to ones that recovered from it. And um, also really important, the subjects in relation to disease duration, um, which published by Hornick et al. So these are really important things as science that we look into observing um, these types of uh, differences in MECFS patients. Main thing that we wanted to include, and an important thing that we also wanted to measure in our uh, review, um, Joe will talk about the B cells afterwards, but the interpretation of the immunological data in relation to particular symptoms may reveal associations between different immunological findings. For example, something we find in NK cells might be linked to the cytokines, or cytokines related to B cells. And it's really good to see the well-structured studies to define an hypothesis, uh, which should be a center of a focus to understand why this immune cell might be involved. 
And also new approaches uh, to stratification are beginning to review underlying mechanisms, which is absolutely important uh, also in ME-CFS. So these are the things. So we wanted to basically summarize all the things we've done so far in immunology in, immunology in ME-CFS and also basically get an idea how to go forward. And uh, I'm, I have to say it's really promising how these research groups go forward, basically with better research, collaborations, and so on. Um, finally, um, so the Twitter is really important, social media. Um, so I'm just putting up there. Um, this is something I use to also engage with patients, but also they will send me a paper. So have a look at this, which is really helpful and, and, vi and vital. So if you're ever interested in, uh, in, in looking me up or looking at my tweets about B cells or MECFS or immunology or science, please um, find on my Twitter. Thank you for that. Thank you. Joe Cambridge, Joe. Right, thank you. Thank you, Fane. All done. As you can probably imagine, I don't Twitter or tweet or anything like that. <laughs> Fane does all that. Okay, so um, my uh, involvement in MECFS comes from rituximab. Now, what I want to do is just sort of explain a, a few bits about rituximab, why we use it in rheumatoid and lupus. Um, which may be useful um, when we look at the results of the trial that come out uh, towards the end of this year. Now, we started using rituximab in rheumatoid arthritis at the end of 1998. We used it in patients based on a hypothesis developed that involved immune complexes. So basically, remove immune complexes, get rid of the inflammation, patients get better. If we had, but only a proportion of patients with rheumatoid, a so-called seropositive, if we treated the seronegative patients, rituximab wouldn't have worked. That's been borne out. Um, lupus patients' lives are saved by rituximab, particularly patients with very severe renal disease. Um, and we use rituximab there all the time off-label. The two trials of rituximab in lupus have not reached their primary endpoints because they can't figure out which patients are going to respond or not. I think we know, but we'll just have to wait for a little while longer. So I just want to talk a little bit about rituximab, because you're all going to be interested in the results of the trial. Just to remind you all, I think this works. Does this work? No? Anyway. Anyway, the thing about rituximab is it depletes all the peripheral, CD20 targeted, so it gets rid of all the peripheral B cells, but leaves your stem cells alone, so they're not hurt and also leaves the plasma cells alone. So looking at the relationships between all these cell types is really important to understand how and where rituximab is going to be useful in different diseases, and all diseases differ, I can assure you. So what happens to the B cells when you use rituximab? On the left-hand side, you can see we use these markers, which I'll just mention briefly, D and 27. They're just ways of, of dividing naive from memory cells and I've seen so you mark them there. And this is before rituximab. When the patient's depleted, you get a few memory cells left behind, um, which we also work on why they're left behind. And then when the B cells come back, it's just like being a baby again. All your B cells come out of the bone marrow and start to repopulate. So again, the relationship, the most important thing is the relationship between the cells that come back and relapse. That's what we've focused on for a while because the number of B cells coming back is, in several of the diseases we work on, not related to the disease. So it's, it's something specific about specific different B cell populations, and there are lots of different ones, I can assure you. Okay, so what we came to the conclusion early on was that um, rituxan works best when autoantibodies, or aberrant antibodies, are part of the disease process. And the main reason after all our experience is that rituximab works best by stopping all the new B cells coming out of the bone marrow and also turning into these antibody-producing cells. But also B cells, of course, tell T cells what to do. I mean, they're the controllers in a way, although T cells are quite smart too. But targeting T cells in patients like with rheumatoid arthritis, for example, doesn't work. Targeting B cells does. I just want to, this looks complicated, but I'll just go through it slowly. It's data from um, Olaf and Oyston's beautiful um, rituximab trial work. And all you have to do is look at months after rituximab and the little um, 
vertical dotted lines and doses of rituximab. The blue line is clinical function. So the higher, the better your clinical function, the higher the blue dot. Um, and then all I want you to concentrate on is the, the black triangles. Now, the black triangles um, tell you how the B cells are turning over, how, they're, how well they're turning from naive to memory cells. Because we know when you give rituxim, you get rid, as I said, of all those peripheral B cells. They're all gone. But this is another measure of sort of maturation. You can see here that the B cells, the, the sign of differentiation, the black things go down below the grey area. When the patient gets worse again, over there at 36 months, the, the differentiation starts again. So the B cells are beginning to turn over again. I'll just show you another example. Now, this patient didn't respond to rituximab. And you can see here that the blue line goes up a little bit at the end there, but that could be part of the normal. We don't have the bits in between. This patient didn't have any peripheral B cells. However, if you look at those um, black triangles, you can see it they don't go down below the grey into the grey area. That means somewhere in the body, there are cells still, B cells still turning over, doing goodness knows what, but they're still there, they're not being depleted. So this is a key focus of our lab. Okay, so our hypothesis in MECFS is that there is some kind of wrong immune response that's involved in the energy generating processes in a number of immune cells and other somatic cells. Um, there's a lot of em en evidence for this by many groups, many very good big groups around, which I'm sure, sure you've heard. So I think it's sort of, we know there's something wrong with energy metabolism. So what we've been doing at UCL, as I say, it's really, really important to identify, firstly, what cells you want to get rid of and what cells are involved in the disease process. Otherwise your trials are just not going to work because you, you'll be including the wrong patients. It's really important if B cell depletion works, know why it works. It sounds self-evident, but you'd be surprised. Okay, so we use various phenotypic markers, which again, I won't go into detail about, but they go from where they come out of the bone marrow, 10 to the 9 B cells come out every day, turn over and turn into memory cells, or actually most of them die, but still, the ones that go on are selected turn into antibody-producing cells. So as you, the people who were here last year know, we found changes in two different areas of B cells, in the sort of earliest B cells, coming out of the bone marrow here, and also in a population of memory cells. And if I've got time, I'll just go through some of the work we've been doing in the last year or so on what these cells actually are and what they could do and how they could be involved. Now, the first type, the memory type ones, they're not classical memory cells, they're actually marginal zone B cells. They're actually, even though memory cells usually associated with IgG, these make IgM. Anyway, they're really, really important, these cells, in responses to EBV. And it's been a passion of mine for years. And Fane's been working on the CD24 um, molecule. Right, I'll just say a little bit about these marginal zone B cells because of their very strong link with EBV. Now, I'll just show you here what we found. If you just look at, these are just marginals, like lots of marginal zone B cells are in the gray area. And the MECFS patients are the black dots. And you can see that the patients have got a lot more. The frequency of these cells is much higher, of the, the highly high expressing ones in the MECFS patients. And this has been repeated uh, in serial studies, I think, Fane has that. And the other thing we found, that there was a correlation with disease duration. So again, you can see the, these are just the MECFS patients. They're all up there in the high gray area. But with disease duration, they tend to, to decrease, which is what other people are finding with other parameters. Um, these particular cells um, show an increased response to toll-like receptors in vitro in culture. So they're used to responding to bugs quite quickly. And they're, it's a sort of a classical marginal zone type B cell. So the role of these cells is really interesting because when you think about EBV and other viruses that, that infect, the first phase, before you get the immune system going, which takes about a week, you know, we'd all be dead. So we need sort of these rapid response antibodies, these sort of T independent ones, because the T cells take a while to get their act together. I don't like T cells. Okay, so 
These innate B cells are in all of us. They make up about 10% of our peripheral blood lymphocytes. They're present in, in all races, across all countries, all populations, everywhere. Okay? So, and they're present in the subepithelium of the tonsils. They're already a bit activated, so they're already ready to go. Um, and when they're, after they have been activated, they migrate to the spleen and live there. You find huge numbers of them. They produce IgM, and they produce it just in germ. They don't, antibodies, as you know, have lots of mutations when they're stimulated, but these ones can get them. It's a bit complicated. But the most interesting thing about these is they recognize carbohydrates, in fact, n acetyllactosamine which is present on a lot of blood cells, and it's particularly increased when the a cell gets infected with the virus. So this is sort of like a lectin interaction. So it is thought that these antibodies are really important in the very early phases of virus, in, phase of virus infection, where they sort of paint the infected cell. It doesn't matter if it's infected with CMV, flu, whatever. And so that fixing um, attracts a, a substance called complement, and it can cause, can actually kill the infected cell expose the intracellular bits of the virus, all the capsid antibodies, to the proper immune system. And then the proper immune system kicks in. Um, these cells are called 9G4B cells, um, but the thing normally is they don't make much antibody. They float around, if you get an EBV infection, they shoot up and then they go away. So they're, they're present, but they're, they're only present transiently and they're present and their numbers increase hugely in uh, after EBV infection. They're also interestingly associated with a number of autoimmune diseases which I've been involved in, particularly lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. But they're very, when they go wrong, they're, they're drivers of autoimmunity. Okay, now we've started looking at these cells in chronic fatigue patients. Now we haven't got much data yet, I just purely there are way, you know, we're just exploring this area. Um, this is just looking at the total 9G4 positive, the, the antibodies that are produced by these cells in the patients. And you can see that the IgM levels are normal, but the IgG is lower. Now this is, without going into it, it is interesting. So they're not, they're not being diverted into the IgG fraction. Okay, so to summarise an awful lot of stuff on these antibodies, as I've said, these antibodies recognise carbohydrate naturally all the time, branched or linear. Five minutes. Thank you. That's five out of ten. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ignore it. I'm getting it. <laughs> so what one of the hypotheses is that we all make loads of these IgM 9G4 antibodies after an infection. We know that patients with ME-CFS don't respond, they probably respond okay at the beginning, but then they, they, they don't recover from it. I mean, it's like rheumatoid patients. Not all people who get, you know, swollen, sore knees go on to get rheumatoid arthritis. You need the genetics, you need the loads of other factors involved. But, I mean, what could be happening, we are talking about antibodies and things in serum before, is that these antibodies are really interesting because they bind to carbohydrates on a number of different glycosylated proteins, present on neurons and on immune cells. I'm just going to quickly talk about what Fane's been doing. Sorry, Fane. Um, now, he's been working on these CD4, CD24. Now, CD24 is a molecule expressed on, on naive B cells, mostly on IgD-positive ones. And he's published the fact that the... The naive cells in MECFS patients have much higher levels than normal people do. And so what he's been doing now is looking at what they do, what this molecule does in culture. So we're looking at here healthy controls in MECFS patients, MECFS in green. You can see that these have been proliferating, these cells. Um, and the, the ones that haven't proliferated are still holding on to their CD24. Those ones. So when he looked at this, to cut a lot of data short, when he looked at this, so we've got this high retention of CD24 on the patient cells. They're in green over there. And you can see it doesn't matter what age you are, ME patient, you re still retain it. But if you're a young, normal person, you have lower, lower retention. But when you get old, like me, I'm the top one there, um, <laughs> always, 
Um, you can see it's, there's an age relationship, but this is not present in the MECFS patients. So our conclusion is that CD24 is usually lost from normal cells, um, but it seems to be retained on old senescent B cells that have resisted stimulation, so they're still there. Um, the other thing, there's a mark of energy metabolism in uh, senescent cells, which is different from normal B cells. Um, this, this is a thing called AMPK, and I'm just going to show you one slide of the results. So because there's an association with phosphorylation of AMPK, which is an alternative energy source for cells, we wondered, well, we haven't done the patients yet, but Fain has been looking at their metabolism in memory cells. So phosphorylation of uh, AMPK activates signaling pathways that replenish the cell when it gets low on ATP. So we've been looking at the memory cells, which are here. This is the phosphorylation going in that direction. And we find, indeed, that the CD24 positive cells are much more likely. So these sort of senescent retained ones are much more likely to use this sort of alternative energy source rather than the normal energy source. So are they more stressed? Possibly. They seem to look like my old B cells. Um, and so maybe it just indicates that we've got much more of this continuous phosphorylation of AMPK. So the other things we do is look at um, mitochondrial mass and autophagy in these patients. We haven't done that CD24 energy uh, metabolism in patients yet, but we're going to. One minute. Um, but the other thing that Fane's been doing is looking at the size of mitochondria in different B cells, and he's shown a difference between them, which has not been shown before. I won't go into the details. But I just want to say there are differences in what these mitochondria do when you stimulate in vitro. This is with a T-independent stimulus. The purple ones are MECFS patients. Doesn't matter how many times the cells proliferate, they're still lower than the normal controls, which are shown in gray. So we're getting there slowly. So our conclusions are that B cell subsets can be used as a tool to test metabolic changes in these patients, and we're using a lot of different methods. We want to extend this study um, of the memory cells of CD24 in MECFS patients, which Fade's going to be working on. And of course, antibodies, which uh, antibodies can be involved in many different ways in MECFS. You can net, um, Carmen just talked about antibodies to neurotransmitters, and I'm interested in the fact that you get this skewing of the natural antibody pool, persistence of wrong antimicrobial responses, and of course, we're really interested in pursuing the possible role of these antibodies in interfering with metabolic processes, because it would make sense. Okay, so this is our huge team. There's me and Fane, <laughs> and then we work with Christopher in Australia. So um, we're doing our best at UCL, and I'd like to thank our clinical colleagues too at St. Helia and at UCLH. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, some questions, please. Wow, that would be heaven. I would, well, because I'm interested in these uh, innate B cells, I mean, I would follow the response to EBV, because you can look at EBV-specific 9G4 responses as well. So we could look at the specificity of those. Um, and then we're developing assays, or FAIN is, to look at the effect of sera on metabolism. So I think that would be really important. And then to follow them up for like two, five years, whatever. Because they're highly motivated. You can get as much blood as you want. <laughs> One more. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I was just curious. You were looking. Uh, you were looking at this patient study with the CD20. Uh, yes. uh, you were using rituximab and taking CD20 down, and then you were looking at CD23 coming up. How yes. does it look with the CD20 if you look with rituximab to see what happens? CD23 is increased to begin yeah. with. CD23 is lost and from it doesn't come back. Cells. But CD24 does. Uh, yeah. Fain has shown that you lose CD24 from the naive cells and then it get, uh, from the transitional cells to the naive, and then it is re, yeah, it is re, CD24 is 
23 is another molecule I work on. So you've got no, but C20, CD20, which Twitch map is working on, does that regain again? Uh, CD20 is just a molecule on B cells. And yes, when the new B cells come out of the bone marrow, sorry, after rituximab, they will be expressing CD20. Yeah, they do. You can get rid of them again <laughs> if you want to. Okay, many thanks, Fane and um, Joe. Thank you very, very much for that contribution. Cheers.